Today we're in chapter 22. We're here in the book of Ezekiel. We continue a verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Ezekiel. And frankly, as we get into chapter 22, it's one of those studies that it's pretty heavy. I mean, as I was reading it, I was thinking, Lord, you know, uh, there's so much judgment. There's so much judgment, Lord, so help me condemn everybody and feel good about it, you know. <laughs> it's heavy. It's a heavy, heavy chapter, but that's what it's all about. Ezekiel is bringing judgment on the nation of Israel, as we've been seeing through our studies. And chapter 22 is uh, another installment of uh, the judgment, and he's going to be speaking concerning the prophets, the priests, the princes, and the people. We'll be seeing that here in Ezekiel chapter 22. So let's read at uh, verse 1, Ezekiel 22, verse 1. I'll read verses 1 and 2, introduce our study and get into it. Ezekiel chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. And so as we get into chapter 22, once again, Ezekiel is uh, going to give the reasons why God is bringing judgment on the nation. Remember with me that Ezekiel is in captivity in Babylon, and so he's actually prophesying concerning God's judgment on the nation of Israel and what is going to take place there. As we've been going through Ezekiel, it, it has interested me to, uh, to consider that multiple times as we've approached chapter 22, multiple times God has clarified the reason why he is bringing judgment. And, and here he's bringing a word of God's judgment on the city of Jerusalem. Now, notice with me that he refers to Jerusalem as a bloody city. Now, the reason he speaks of her when it says in verse 2, will you judge, will you judge the bloody city? The reason why he refers to her as a, a city that is bloody is because of all the violence in that city. We're going to see that in just a moment. The city was known for its violence. It is also a city that, because of its idolatry, became known for the... Uh, the murder of its own children. And so God refers to this city as a bloody city because of the violence, because of the blood that is being shed there in the city of Jerusalem. Now remember with me that the book of Ezekiel was written somewhere around 592 to 570 before Christ. That's when the book was written. But Isaiah had something to say in the same way when Isaiah wrote concerning Jerusalem. And you see that in Isaiah in uh, chapter 1, verse 21. And remember with me that Isaiah was written some 750 years before Christ. And so when you take into consideration that Isaiah wrote 750 years before Christ and Ezekiel was written about 592, there's a long history of bloodshed. And so when Isaiah is writing in chapter 1, verse 21, he writes how the faithful city has become a harlot it was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. And so God has been bringing a word of judgment against the city for a long time. And so God asks the question in verse 2, Son of man, will you judge, will you judge the bloody city? So by asking that question to him, will you judge, will you judge, he's emphasizing the need for judgment because he's about to show all the abominations of that city. When he asks, are you going to judge in that way, that's for emphasis. If you're going to function as a judge, you're going to need to state the evidence against them. What is this city guilty of, and why should God bring judgment? Why should Jerusalem receive judgment from God? Well, he begins by telling us that the city is guilty of violence, of oppression. The city is, is guilty of bloodshed. Now, you see that when he says, the city is a bloody city. But he repeats that several times. Notice verse 3. The city sheds blood in her own midst. Notice verse 4. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed. Notice verse 6. He says, uh, each one of you has used his power to shed blood in you. Verse 9. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. Verse 12. In you they take bribes to shed blood. In verse 13, therefore I beat my fist at the dishonest prophet which you have made and at the bloodshed 
which has been in your midst. God over and over again emphasizes the violence and bloodshed that is there found in the city of Jerusalem. The violent acts that are being carried out within her has brought judgment about. It's time to bring judgment. Now, God had made it clear earlier that he was going to bring judgment. He's been doing so all along. Remember with me in chapter 21, verse 25, how it had said, to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. He's already said it's time. It's time to bring judgment. And God is simply emphasizing the reality of that. He's repeating himself. I'm going to bring judgment. Now, the people didn't repent. When God brought words of warning, they heard them, but it's, it's, it was as if they were deaf. It was as if they, that God wasn't saying anything at all. So even though God had been bringing warnings to them and repeating himself over and over again, the city still continues in its hard-hearted rejection. It made no effort to avert what was about to happen. And so judgment is coming. And it's coming because of her many sins. Now, I mentioned to you how that Isaiah wrote some 750 years before Christ and spoke concerning how this city had become bloody. It's interesting that this is something that, that continues through its history. Even when the Lord Jesus Christ came, when Jesus came and, and he came to the city, remember with me how he wept over it. And, and remember with me what he said. It's, it's recorded in Matthew 23, verse 35. Jesus there, you know, several hundred years later says this. Jesus spoke of the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom Jesus said, you murdered between the temple and the altar. Jesus remembered that they had killed a prophet there. And he went on in Matthew 23, at verse 37, and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to her. Jerusalem had a history of violent rejection of the word of God, a history of killing the prophets. Jesus referred to that. Jesus spoke about that. Later on, when the first martyr of the Christian church, a man by the name of Stephen, was about to be killed, he asked a question of the people who, who were about to kill him, and, and in asking of that question, he was emphasizing that same sin. Because in Acts 7.52, he asked the question, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And so this was a history. Jerusalem is being judged because Jerusalem is a city of bloodshed. Now notice verse 3, how he says, then say, thus says the Lord God, the city sheds blood in her own midst that her time may come. She makes idols within herself to defile herself. So one of the ways that they were guilty of bloodshed was in their practice of idolatry. Now, when we were looking at chapter 16, remember with me verses 20 and 21. Remember how that we read, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured, sacrificed to idols to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them up by causing them to pass through the fire. They had been guilty of killing their own children in their idolatrous practices. They didn't repent of the sin, so their days of judgment now draws near. Now, God had said that he would do this, and so God was about to make them a reproach to the world. He had made it very clear what was going to take place. He had made it very clear that were they to reject him, they would become a reproach. In, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 28, verses 36 and 37, it says, The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. There you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. So because of God's judgment, neighboring countries are going to see her as a defiled city. So he says again in verse 3, the city sheds blood in her own midst that her time may come and she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed, have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You've caused your days to draw near and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations, a mockery to all countries. 
Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. Verse 6, look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you, they have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things, profaned my Sabbaths. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst, they commit lewdness. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You take usury and increase. You've made profit from your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Therefore, behold, therefore, I beat my fists at the dishonest profit which you've made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, remove your filthiness completely from you. You shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so, as he begins here in verse 6, God is speaking to the princes. The princes would be the rulers. They, they're the ones who are overseeing government. These are the ones who, who should have upheld justice. But instead of being just, instead of pleading the cause of the weak and the needy, they use their power to oppress. They even put to death people unjustly. It's interesting how he begins to outline their sins. Notice in verse 7 how he says, in you they have made light of father and mother. He begins to outline their, uh, outline their sins. In other words, parents are dishonored. Parents were lightly regarded. Parents were being robbed of the honor that was due to them. This was coming through the princes. Another way of speaking of government. The influence was coming through those who were ruling. Now, I want to make a point here. Notice again how it says, they have made light of father and mother. Parents are dishonored. Now, we look at this and we say to ourselves, Well, this was over 2,000 years ago. Parents are still dishonored. Question is asked, in our society, in the society that you and I live in, in our culture, let me ask this question. Do we honor parents? Do we, as a nation, do we honor fathers and mothers? Do we honor parents, parenthood? Do we? The answer is really no. No, we don't. All we have to do is ask the simple question. A mother who chooses to re remain home and raise her children, is she honored? Mama, if you decide to remain home and raise your kids, does society stand up and honor you? Well, you know and I know that's a loaded question. Of course they don't. Because they'll ask you, what do you really do with your life? What do you do that has importance? What do you do that has worth? What do you do that has value? And for you, you know, if you're one of these moms who are a stay-at-home mom actually raising kids, you're not honored by this society. It's true, the greeting cards and flower shops love you on Mother's Day. There's no doubt about that because you're a means to profit. But do they really honor you? Does the society really honor a mom who chooses to stay home and to live with less than she'd like? But to raise a child, to care for the child from the time the baby's born, to raise the child and care for the child. It is so unusual today for moms to be stay-at-home moms. You just don't see that. Neighborhoods are entirely deserted. You know this and I know this. I'm speaking to a group of people who already know what I'm about to say, but it's true. See, it wasn't that long ago when you actually went through a neighborhood and it was actually a neighborhood. You actually knew the next-door neighbors. You know, I don't know my next-door neighbors. I don't know them. We wave at each other once in a while, but that's about it. My neighborhood changes. I've had the people across the street, we've had two or three families, two families, three families that have moved into the house right across the street from me. 
The house next door to that, we've had two or three families there. The house next door to that on the other side, we've had three families there since I've lived there. You know, my next door neighbor to, to my north has been there all along, but he kind of hides in his house. I never see him. And the people next door to me, I only see them when they come to get their mail. And that's about it. We don't have what you call neighborhoods anymore. We don't have stay-at-home moms where they actually are not only taking care of their kids, they're, they're going to take care of you too. And if you do something wrong, you're going to get beaten up by somebody else's mom, and then you're going to get beaten by your own for being beaten up by somebody else's mom. That's the way it used to be. Not anymore. Because we don't have neighborhoods, guys. You know that. I know that. Do we honor fathers and mothers? Do we? No. You know what we do? We have what we call the nanny state now. We expect other people to raise our kids. We expect schools to do that. You see, now this, this may sound political. It's not. It's practical. Take it this way, and hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying. We want the president to speak to our kids when parents ought to be doing that, frankly. Mom and dad should be doing that. I don't need my president to tell my kids to stay in school and do well. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. But we applaud those kinds of things because we expect the government to take care of all of that for us. That's not a new thought, guys. God was speaking to the nation of Israel and he said, your princes have caused corruption. It's their influence that have brought you to the point where you don't even honor your mother and your father anymore. It was through the influence of these princes. We have to ask the question, who has the role of teaching children morals? Our society or their parents? So not only did they make light of father and mother, he goes on in verse 7, he says, in you they've mistreated the fatherless and the widow. Now, the fatherless, the orphan, and the widow were the most defenseless in society. They were to be cared for. They were to be treated with compassion. In the Old Testament, you can find volumes of scriptures that relate to that. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. If I had a uh, parcel of property, and we'll say it's in a rectangular or it's in a square shape, I was not to, to, to take every portion of it. I was supposed to leave the edges almost like a circle. The edges were to be left unharvested so that the poor could come onto my grounds and take the fruit because they didn't have enough for themselves. God actually put that into the law. And that's something that didn't disappear. That mentality didn't disappear in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in James, in chapter 1, verse 27, James said, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. And so that was a, a practical thing. They were mistreating the fatherless and the widow. See, they didn't have anything, which gives you insight into why Jesus would commend that poor widow who gave her two mites because she had no form of support. She was completely destitute. And that's why Jesus commends the widow as he's watching how people put money into the treasury and then takes notice of this widow and says, the others have given out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. And the significance is not the small amount numerically. It was the incredible faith that she had in God because that's what she lived on. Nobody else was taking care of this woman. It was her and God. And that's why God, Jesus commends that because the widow was to be cared for and God was caring for this widow. Now, notice in verse 8, he says, You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. Not only have you disrespected man, you are disrespecting me by not honoring me, the things that pertain to me and the days that are set apart to worship me. In verse 9, in you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. These are the ones who are making false accusations, and in their false accusations caused people to be put to death. Verse 9, in you are those who eat on the mountains. Now, he's not opposed to people going out and having picnics on mountains. You're thinking, oh, no, I was in Big Bear the other day and I had a barbecue. No, he's not talking like that. 
When they would go to the mountains, that's another way of speaking of going to the high places. The high places is where they uh, made their sacrifices and had their false altars there. So it's, he's speaking concerning the fact that they were practicing idolatry. And so along with their practice of idolatry, uh, there was also sexual sin that would take place. They, they had sexual immorality because sexual immorality is normally associated with idolatry. Now he says in verse 10, In you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. So their sins are unbelievable. They're having relations, uh, sexual relations with a variety of people that the law forbids it. When, it. when it says here that you are uncovering your father's nakedness, it's another way of saying you are shaming your father. How are you shaming your father? Because in its context, there are men who are having physical relationships with their father's wife, not necessarily their mom, but the woman their father is married to. And so he's saying you are violating your father's wife. You, you are ignoring the laws that pertain to physical relationships. The time of impurity when a woman is having her menstrual cycle, she was not to be approached. You don't care. In other words, you're like animals. You're lewd. You, you have no moral, no moral restrictions. You don't respect. Not only that, verse 12, in you they take bribes to shed blood. Not only did they have bribes, but they also had uh, usury, which, is, which was a high rate of interest. And they were making a profit through extortion. You're ignoring the law. You're not caring about people. You're, you're taking bribes. You have high interest rates. There's extortion. There's moral corruption that exists there in Jerusalem. Now, these are the kinds of sins that are rampant when people forget God. And in Psalm 917, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And that's what happened. They had forgotten Him. They had forgotten the Lord. And that's what he says in verse 12. He says, you have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Because there's no fear of God in their sight, they're making a profit off of everybody else. And so what happens? Well, verse 13, behold, therefore I beat my fist at the dishonest profit which you've made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure? Can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I'll scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, remove your filthiness completely from you. You shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, to me, this is very telling. Notice verse 13. I beat my fist at dishonest profit which you have made. God hates greed. He says, I hate your dishonest profit. Corporate greed. And we all see examples of that. I mean, all you need to do is read your newspaper. That guy, Madoff, I was watching the news today. He had three houses that uh, are going up for sale, if you guys are interested. Um, they were showing them on TV, New York, Florida. Uh, just three of the houses they showed were accumulated value of something like $21, 22000000 million. He had boats, various boats. He made all of that money just by ripping people off. Everybody knows that. We read our newspaper. We listen to the news. This man was a, was a, a poster child for corporate greed, a poster child for it. And, and we've seen that. God hates that. God hates the refi ripoffs. I wonder how many people in this room own your home. I'm not asking you to raise your, your hand. You, when you signed your pa papers and, and your agent and brokers and all of that were giving you these stacks of papers, you remember that? Maybe you've done it recently, you know, or you did a refi, and they have this huge stack of papers. Did you read every word? Did you, did you sit there and say, just a second, uh, I'll be through in about two hours. I mean, I've got so many things. Or did you listen to your real estate agent, whom you trust, right? They wouldn't rip you off, right? And that broker, best friend, right? Sometimes they are your best friends. Sometimes they're not. Did you listen to them? Did they advise you? 
Did they say, just sign here, those little yellow tabs there, and so you just kind of went through your name like that, got it done as fast as you could because you were going to get some keys pretty soon. You were going to drive up in that driveway that that, that home was going to be yours. Were you excited like I was when I got my home? I, I, I expect that you were. I was. My first house, man, check it out. It's a mansion, 990 square feet, <laughs> two bedrooms. No air conditioning, but we had one of these sump coolers. When you turned it on, it would blow your wig off your head. <laughs> uh, the master bedroom, we had a king-size water bed. That was it. I had to put my back on the wall to slide around it when I got in. I mean, our, our bedroom was eight by eight. I mean, it was tiny, but that was my master bedroom. And I loved that house. I love that house. Four kids in one bedroom, you know, and then Marie and I had, you know, the bed in our bedroom, and that was about it. But did I, did I read every word? No, I have to be honest. No, I didn't. Could I have been ripped off? Absolutely. Did I trust them? Yes, I did. Would it have been my responsibility if something would have happened that I didn't know? Absolutely. Could something have been hidden within those contracts that I didn't understand? Did people get ripped off not that long ago, and are they still dealing with that now? Yeah. Does God like that? He hates it. He hates corporate greed. God hates the refi ripoffs, where people took advantage of innocent people buying homes. God hates that kind of thing. Do you think God loves escalating interest rates? You know, somebody sends you a card, they're your best friend. They're going to give you a card at 2.9%. But you don't read the fine print, and it says if you are one second late, it goes up to 19.8. <laughs> you don't notice that, do you? Because, man, I'm using this card to pay off that card. And before you know it, you have 10 cards revolving out there in the credit world. And then somebody rips off your identity and makes up with everything that you have. No, God hates that. God hates the social injustice. God hated the way that the, the princes were ripping off the people. And he makes it very clear. And what does he say he's going to do? Verse 15, I will scatter you among the nations. I will disperse you. He'll judge them for these sins. They're going to need to realize that they've sinned against him. In Micah, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the prophet Micah said, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields, take them by violence, also houses, and seize them. So they oppress a man in his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil time. You devise ways to, to rip people off from their own inheritance. And God says, and I hate that. Verse 17, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become dross from silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, and therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as, as men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it. So I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yes, I will gather you, blow on you with the fire of my wrath. You shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so shall you be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. So Jerusalem, instead of being a place of refuge, you are going to be a place of judgment. You have become dross. Now, we don't use that word often. Dross is waste. It's impurity. It's the scum that rises to the top when you're melting a metal. And what he's saying is, you become worthless. And so you're going to undergo a fiery purging. That came through Nebuchadnezzar in 588 to 586. 
because God's holiness demands a response. He says, I'll be pouring my fury out on you. Verse 23, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the, the prey. They have devoured people. They've taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath, so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions, divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppress the stranger. So Ezekiel levels charges, and now he's leveling charges in all segments on the prophets, the priests, the princes, and the people. Now notice with me, he speaks concerning the conspiracy of her prophets there in verse 25. Now the prophets are mentioned first because their sins had the greatest evil influence. The prophets were the ones who were supposed to be speaking for God, and so their influence from the perspective that the people believed that these men were speaking in the name of God was incredible. It was a society that looked to the prophets to hear from God. And so when these prophets are, 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 are bringing false prophecies, they're of greater, greater uh, judgment because they, of necessity, will carry that because they have been speaking in the name of God. They're under stricter judgment. And Jeremiah spoke of them. Jeremiah was a contemporary of Ezekiel. And in chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone's given to covetousness. From the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the false prophets were not bringing a warning the way Ezekiel was, the way Jeremiah was, the way Daniel did. These were men who were coming and saying, there's peace, don't worry about it, everything's okay, judgment isn't coming. So God first begins with them. You know, one of the things, guys, let me speak from my heart for a moment to you. One of the things that makes us safe as a ministry is the fact that what we try to do is we try to take a verse-by-verse -verse approach to Scripture so that we can get the whole counsel of God. And so all we need to do is, all we need to do is just study the Word. Just, we're going through Ezekiel. We'll go through chapters. This chapter is not a cheery chapter. It's not like I was reading it and preparing, saying, oh boy, Lord, this is great. This is good stuff. I'm enjoying this a lot. You know, it's a heavy chapter. And yet it's God's Word. And God, it's a warning to us. It's something that we can learn from, you see. A false prophet is saying, oh, don't worry about it. There's no problem at all. Everything's okay. Ezekiel was a genuine prophet. And he's saying, no, that's where you're wrong. Jeremiah was a genuine prophet. And so God's speaking through Jeremiah as well as Ezekiel is saying, no, I'm bringing judgment. You need to know that. You need to know it because you're idolatrous. You need to know it. You kill your children. You need to know it because you rip off the poor. You need to know it because you don't take care of the widows. You need to know it because look how you're treating the orphans. You need to know it because you don't like justice in your, in your four walls there, Jerusalem, and you're going to be judged for it. That was not a popular message whatsoever. And so God first begins to speak to the prophets. He's saying, as a result of your false prophets, you've made many widows. What do you mean? Well, they were saying, don't worry about it. So the soldiers went off to war, and they got killed, producing widows in the nation because God was not in that. God wasn't directing them to do that. So they died in battle needlessly. In verse 26, he speaks of the priests, the priests who have violated God's law, profaned his holy things. So instead of upholding the law, the next one to be spoken to is the priest because what they did is they blotted out the distinction between that which is holy and that which is unholy because they lived unholy lives. They could not preach a holy message. What they were was speaking so loudly that people couldn't really hear a word that they were saying because what they were was unholy. Jesus, when he was speaking in his day in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, said it like this. He said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. 
saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They took God's word, put it aside, set up a system of tradition, said, just follow our traditions because we're giving you the right interpretation of God's word. And Jesus said, no, you're hypocrites because what you've done is you've created a worldly system. He said to them later on in Matthew 23, he said, you travel around the world to make one convert and once you've converted him, you make him twice the child of hell that you yourself are. He says, you're not making them better, you're making them worse. They're better off not knowing me than knowing me in the way you're teaching them. That's a heavy condemnation. So he speaks to the priests. Verse 27, he speaks to the princes. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people. Your princes, your government officials are wicked. They're unfeeling. They're only interested in personal advantage and personal gain. They're only interested in profit. Because for them, material gain outweighs everything else in their lives. And they're getting personal gain from holding these positions as princes. Sometimes we might even see something similar today in our own political system where we have lifelong politicians who have never held a job. They basically have lived off the public dole their whole adult lives. And that's what they do. I mean, they make a living off of your tax dollars. That's why they spend them so easily. Material gain outweighs everything else in their lives. James in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, You have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you, drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? And then in verse 28, he speaks of the prophets. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions, divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, and the Lord had not spoken. False prophets fashioned supposed messages from God, backing up the prince's lies. There will always be false teachers in our day. We can call them false pastors who will agree with whatever that person in office says if it gets them on TV, gets them some face time on TV. They want that fame. They want that attention. While well, the prophets were false and God said so. And then finally, this all affects the people. Verse 29, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy. They wrongfully oppressed the stranger. The people are following the example of the prophets, the priests, and the princes. Moral standards are corrupt from the top to the bottom. Isaiah 9, 16 says the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. See, I, 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 this, this may be wrong. Maybe I shouldn't say this, so... I'll say it. Okay. Well, it's no big deal. It's just I have to be careful. It's no big deal to me anyway, but maybe to you. I was asked a question. Forgive me if this offends you. Someone asked me recently, Pastor, how, how come you, how come, this is the question, this is how it was posed. It's almost a direct quote. How, how come you knew what would happen once our president took office? How come you knew that? I laughed. My answer was, I read the Bible. I don't trust anybody who believes, no? I don't trust anybody who believes that killing babies is okay. I don't. I don't. I, I don't. How can I? How can I? I, don't, I just don't believe. Now listen, some of you have been in this fellowship for a while. 
I have some who've been here for 28 years. Mike, my assistant, administrative assistant, has been here 27 years. Now, you usually stick in a place when you agree with the pastor, normally. How can you stay somewhere 20 years, 20 years, and say, I never heard that said? How can you say that? America took dumb pills. Insulting, forgive me, I don't mean it that way. Didn't think, didn't pray, didn't seek the Lord, didn't consider, and America reaps what America sows. That's what, that's what happens, absolutely. Absolutely. As a Christian, if you ask me the question, who would you like to have a meal with, either living or dead, if you had the opportunity, as was asked of our president? As a Christian, if you could sit down and have a meal with anybody, living and dead, who would it be in your... Now, if you say, Madonna, get out of here. <laughs> Brittany. Who would you, think about it. If you actually could, who would, who, who do you want to have a marriage supper with? I want to have a meal with Jesus Christ. I mean, the minute you ask me that, I'm going to say, Jesus Christ, who else would I want to have a meal with? Are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Jesus Christ doesn't even have to be a religious thing. I just like to eat with the man. I mean, he can make, he can make fish and loaves multiply. I can eat as much as I want. I mean, it doesn't... My president, who claims to be a believer, said Mahatma Gandhi. Now, you tell me. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Keep those kinds of things in mind. Listen, I'm not saying that our president needs to be an evangelist. I understand. But when given an opportunity to answer a question, you're going you're gonna to say what is the most politically expedient thing, and I have to tell you, Prophets, priests, princes affect the people. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. They affect the people. So the people took after their leadership. If our president would have stood up and said, listen, I don't want to preach my religion, kids, but I'm a Christian, and I would love to have a meal with Jesus Christ, I would have wept with joy and I said, oh, bless you, Lord. Jesus' name was used in a wonderful way. I have to tell you, prophets, priests, princes affect the people. They affect the people, and that's what God's talking about here. And so what is he going to do? He's going to bring judgment. But notice verse 30, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall, stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. There was nobody that he could find, not a man who would stand in the gap. Because of this, they were judged. There is a gap between people's profession and people's practice. There's a guy by the name of Barna. He wrote a book recently called Seven Tribes. And in his book, Seven Tribes, Barna points out that 66% of the U United States adult population identified as Christians are lax in their belief and in their practice 
of that faith. In other words, they're professing Christians. But 66% who call themselves a believer do not do what Jesus Christ taught. Only 17% of adults are consistent in their beliefs and their behaviors. 17% of the body of Christ, or at least the professing body of Christ, 17 out of 100 are actually doing what Jesus taught us to do. Now, why is this world going in the direction that it is? Because 83 of them don't care, and only 17 do. God looked for someone to stand in the gap so that he wouldn't destroy. He says, I couldn't find one. I couldn't, I couldn't find anybody there in that, in that nation, anybody. He says, nobody would stand in the gap. So I poured my indignation on them. Now, ultimately, I have to tell you this, because I don't want to leave us in sin. There was a man who was found that would stand in the gap. His name is Jesus. Ultimately, a man was found, Jesus Christ. And the work of redemption was done by our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the one who stands in the gap. The work of redemption was performed and completed by our Savior, Jesus Christ. But the work of evangelism is carried on by those who follow him. Jesus brought redemption. He stands in the gap. But you and I take that message to a world that needs to embrace this one who actually died on that cross for us so that we might have life with God. And so when he was looking at that time, he didn't find that man. But that's not as if that man wasn't going to come because Jesus did. And as Jesus came, Jesus fulfilled his Father's perfect will, dying on that cross for us in order that he might take upon himself our sin. And in doing so, the wrath that was to be placed on me was placed on him. Jesus took it upon himself. I, in faith, embrace him and say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Jesus took upon himself the punishment that was due to me, and I love you and thank you for that. And as a result of that, I will embrace you and follow you because you have washed me clean from my sins and because you have come into my life and you are my personal Lord and Savior, I have a relationship with you. And not only do I have a relationship with you individually, but I also have been brought into the family of God and I now have relationships with other people who love you. So together we can hold hands and do the work of ministry and go out and take this message to a world that needs Jesus Christ because I need you and you need me and we need each other to do the work that God called us to do. But it all goes back to that one who stood in the gap, Jesus himself. And from there, we progress. But it begins when you open your heart to the Lord and say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Lord, I am worthy of your judgment. I am guilty, but forgive me, Lord, because I truly am sorry, and I do repent, and I ask you to wash me and cleanse me and come into my life. And as a result of that, I will take this message, live it, and I will give it to other people, to the glory of God.